and another guy from L.A. Yeah, it's our, um, our another boy who ended up. Um, wow. So how Valley. how in the world did you end up in Contra Costa? Matt has spent nearly his entire career working out of a location that most of us didn't hear about very early, and then we heard about later, and that was Contra Costa. It turns out that it's an amazing place with unrooted vines, sandy soils. So, Matt, That's how fun. did you end up in Contra Costa? Well, first I want to uh, thank Joel for inviting me to this panel. Um, I've been on uh, wine geek panels before, but I've never been on a wine geezer panel. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> but, um, no, it, it, it uh, you know, my, my introduction to wine was, uh, you know, when I finally hit my double digit years, my grandfather put, you know, I was 10 years old, my grandfather put a little wine in my water glass. And my, my mom was raised on a subsistence farm in Contra Costa, right, you know, right next to these old vines. And uh, she was uh, raised on a subsistence farm and my grandfather made wine for the table. Um, of course, you know, through, through you know, growing up in Southern California, I only had a chance to spend the summers, uh, a couple weeks every summer, uh, visiting cousins. And um, so those little water drops in the water glass turned out to be sneaking into my grandfather's uh, cellar uh, with my cousins. And, um, you know. So is that what you were doing in that picture with that uh, young child of yours? Were you sneaking water into, uh, into her glass a little bit earlier than you got to it? Uh, actually, that's about a, a third into my career, you know. Um, so uh, at any rate, you know, um, I got through those early years of my wine in introduction, um, even... Um, and you, were, you were living in L.A. at the time. Right, uh, and you and your you and your brother Fred uh, kind of like a, was Fred. Fred was kind of a an honorary fellow, wasn't he? Yeah, we ha my parents had to send him to the farm, uh, so to speak, because uh, <laughs> he was spending you know out of 180 days of a school year, he was probably spending about 175 of them on the beach, <laughs> you know, surfing. So, he was so a surfer. So instead, they sent him to Paso Robles, where it was all beach but no ocean. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, contra, contra, yep, and, and actually the agriculture, you know, he, he, uh, he loved working with my grandfather, um, he made some wines uh, with him in the old redwood fermenters, um, he started Klein in, uh, it bonded it in 1982, I was helping him all along, I was at the time going to school at Berkeley, um, and uh, spent a lot of time out, out with him, and yeah, and you, you got your degree in an interesting subject. Well, I got, uh, I got um, a You're BS degree in entomology. Entomology, so you studied bugs. Yep, and so, you know, I, I figured, you know, my choice was, um, as a career, was either to, um, you know, advance my degree and study them and, uh, or kill them. <laughs> But, so you, you know, became a vineyard and decided to kill him, huh? Well, I didn't. Well, I wasn't uh, smart enough to you, you become a PhD, so I went to Davis and worked on another BS degree. And um, so, we, you know, I took over the winemaking for Klein in '85, and you know, I had to totally wholesale change what my brother was doing because he was still doing it the old way, and um, you know, that first year in 85, I uh, actually bottled only 300 cases under the Klein label. And that's where it started. Just from there, we, you know, uh, you know we got a 90-point score from Robert Parker and, and our production. Robert Parker scores. Weren't they, weren't they wonderful when they happened? <laughs> they, changed, they changed your life. You know, they, a, well, writer, they, they, a writer could change your life in those days. These days, it doesn't happen quite the same way, but boy, Robert Parker was a power. Yeah, no, my brother couldn't sell, he could only sell a case at a time. After that score, we were selling pallets at a time. Yeah, and that's a lot easier. The first time somebody said, I want to order a pallet of wine, I said, what's a pallet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so you guys kind of started out with those, with those kind of Contra Costa wines, and then you, you, know, you kind of begin with a larger volume wine, you know, kind of like I did. You needed a cash flow wine to keep yourself going. No. No? You know, it, it took, you know, it started at 300 cases, went to, it took us 16 years to get to 300,000. But, you know, we were still struggling with money. Um, 
we, we literally started with our inheritance from the sale of, you know, uh, some of you know that my mom's maiden name is Jacuzzi. Her father, my grandfather, and his brothers started the corporation that ultimately in the si uh, early 60s, late 50s, developed the World Pool Spa. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when that sold to a British corporation in 1976, it sold for like $76 million, which would, you know, it was an international corporation. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, our, we were able to start our business on that. But, you know, by the time the, the uh, inheritance got to us, you know, we were a large Catholic uh, Italian based family. It was $12,000. Sounds like a Napoleonic code to me. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I, I you know, after getting out of uh, spending my time at Davis, I, I worked in the Napa Valley for four and a half years while we were kind of gradually building up steam at Klein, and I also had a, a chance to work with some great winemakers. Andrew Chelichev was a con uh, consultant at the winery that I was working for, and I learned certainly a lot from him. Um, but you know, it was uh, it's these vineyards in Oakley that really taught me. The most, and just the school of hard knocks. And so you you dwelled on Oakley. Did you have? Did you own property out there? You had you had some really famous vineyards out there, things like Big Break and Live Oak and um, some others. And I think you were really one of the only. Yeah, there are other people that are focusing out there now, but like you were there early. I mean, yeah, you know, when Gat when it was only Gallo and you know some of the other big boys were pulling wine out of there. Um. Gallo wasn't, at the time, at the, that time, early time, it was mainly Sebastiani that was getting a lot of fruit, but the fruit was still being shipped to home, you know, the fresh market, to home winemakers. Uh, um, so they still were, you know, Frank Evangelo had his um, mm -hmm. label, and he would uh, harvest the uh, grapes and put them in the traditional wooden 32-pound boxes and uh, palletize them up and ship them to all the... Um, produce markets in Chicago, Vancouver, New York, um, which was kind of what saved the viticulture industry once prohibition um, was enacted. Yeah, well, prohibition, and most of the vines out there were planted before prohibition, yeah, yeah, they, uh, and they, uh, many of them are on their own roots, so they look different, don't they? Well, they're, they're traditional uh, head trained or goblet trained. They're, 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 the head is really pretty fairly close to the, uh, the sand, and the sand is Delhi sand. It's uh, basically river sand blown into sand dunes, right. and so their flocks were resistant to right. soils. Um, they were planted, in, most of them were planted in the mid-1880s, which was a time that uh, was, well, you know, it was kind of an outlier time, because uh, uh, essentially it was about six, seven years after the railroad was connected, and so California was Booming. By the mid-1880s, there was a lot of um, uh, uh, income being created, a lot of wealth. And uh, these vineyards are were literally some of the first production vineyards planted. By the end of the 1880s, of course, we went into a big recession. I've always been amused because uh, the people who planted out there um, were farming in an area that was so sandy that they became known as sand lappers. You know, one presumes that they had a lot of sand in their lap, and they grew things, not only grapes, but they grew something known as sand cots, which were apricots, sandy apricots. So it was, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting historical area. area. But they planted those vineyards, um, and they used a lot of different grapes when they were planted. Really, uh, they, they, but they were pretty consistent in what they planted. What kind of grape varieties were they planting well, out there, Matt? You know, when, when, at this early time, you know, when we had to decide what to plant all of California with, the three varieties that clearly raised, rose to the top were Zinfandel, Carignan, and Mataro. And statistically, uh, 100 years ago, um, Mataro was still 30% of all the red wine grapes planted in California. Cal Carignan was even a little bit more. Um, so Mataro is also known as Morbet in France and Monastrel in Spain. So it's got multiple names, but when it came to California, it got called Mataro. It was, you know, it, a lot of the early uh, budwood was being shipped out of the port of Mataro, which is near Barcelona. It's at the French 
Spanish border. And I assume that, uh, and other people assume that, you know, these, this budwood was received by Portuguese and Italians on this side of the world and said, heck, I'm not going to give any credit to the French or the <laughs> Spaniards. So, yeah. you know, it was obviously that Mataro was, uh, Port of Mataro was on the export documentation mm-hmm. of these, this budwood. So you've approached this in a way that's a little, uh, well, not so much unique, but it's a more traditional way. When you make your wine, you're doing blends. Uh, of these grapes, is that true, or you've, that's the way you've ultimately evolved in your thinking about wine? Well, these vineyards are, in my opinion, are um, kind of our last map. What we were doing before the feds got involved and basically screwed everything up for us, you know, with the Volstead Act, in 1920. Yeah, and then the 75 percent rule. It, well, yeah, and that started at 51 in the 50s and gradually got up to 75. Totally arbitrary numbers. Yeah. Um, but uh, so these vineyards really kind of, you know, I've gained unbelievable appreciation for them because what they represent. I mean, besides we were lucky enough to be in one of the most awesome microclimates and soil types to grow these type of varietals. Um, but, you know, as with a lot of old vine Zinfandel that's grown in California, there's rogue vines in there. I mean, these growers, um, when they were planted, there was no nursery to go to and um, you know, buy some Zinfandel vines to replace vines that you know, were mar- mortality. And so they always made their own cuttings and replaced them with whatever they had. Bruno Marcel. Yeah. So you got two wines here? These are blends. Uh, yeah. So which wines are these, Matt? Well, we have our, both our 2013 wines, though. So, um, we have our Live Oak Zinfandel, which is, you know, about a, in this vintage is about 127-year-old vines. There's um, some, uh, of course, Mataro, Carignan, Alicante Boucher, um, a little Black Malvoisie, micro amounts of that, which is the California synonym for Cinso or Malvasia Nero. Um, you know, I'm not a total, one of the, the things that I've, uh, um, added to my wine um, knowledge or my my blending is that um, you know there the petite Syrah was not a variety that was planted in this area you know it was established a lot by mostly Portuguese and it was the Italians that brought um, and propagated petite Syrah but petite Syrah you know um, adds a lot to a blend and and so <clears throat> Petit Syrah has been introduced into Oakley in the last 25 years, and so that's also in this blend. <laughs> These are uh, really delicious ones. You get to have the um, really nice fine tannin structure and that kind of rosy fruit character that you get out of the Oakley area. Those, uh, they have warm days, but they have very windy afternoons, so it cools off very quickly, so the, and surprisingly the acidity is stay up and you get a freshness out of the grapes, which I think is really terrific. Matt, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great talking to you. Awesome. Thanks for being one of us. Thank you, Jeff. One of the geezers, my friend. Yeah. All right. So that's the first three. We got three more coming up. <laughs>